Okay, so reflex arc, there is a stimulus, right? In this case, it is a nail passing into the epidermis. Okay. Um, and so obviously that is damaging to our tissues. Obviously, um, we don't want to stop and think, Hey, like, should I pick my foot up off the nail? Is that beneficial to me? I don't know. Like, no, you don't want to stop and think about it. As soon as you step on the nail, you want to pull your foot away as quickly as possible to hopefully prevent the nail from going, uh, deeper and deeper into your skin and increasing the risk of infection, et cetera, right? We don't want tetanus. And so we have um, these reflexes, which have evolved and developed over the course of our life to produce a pre-programmed fast, don't stop and ask your brain for permission, just do it and then think about it later response. Okay, so um, what does this involve, right? First of all, we have a stimulus that is going to stimulate the dendrites of this sensory neuron, right? And so it's sensory. It is sensing something within the skin. We learned about different types when we looked at the skin before. Um, essentially, this is going to send an afferent message, right? An afferent means to the central nervous system. Okay. So, um, there's an action potential that is generated over here in the axon hillock, right? And it's going to travel lightning fast up this afferent neuron. Note that this here is the neuron cell body. So that's the soma again, just like we talked about for the last exam. Um, and they are all bundled together, right? So this sensory neuron, another and another and another, all of them are bundled together in this um, kind of big white bump right here, right? So in addition to knowing that the action potential travels along the sensory neuron, we also know what these different structures are called, right? So this here, right, uh, we know is the spinal nerve. Okay. Um, it has afferent and efferent information that is sensory information and motor commands. Both are going to be traveling to and from the central nervous system through these spinal nerves. The spinal nerves are the ones that are uh, named according to where they exit the spine. Okay, um, so C1, C2, right, T3, T5, right, so the spinal nerves are what are named, and they carry both sensory and motor information, okay, we know that the sensory neuron is going to travel into the spinal cord via the dorsal root, right, so this entire structure over here is called the dorsal root, Um, and that only contains sensory, right? Afferent neurons, okay? This bumpy thing right here is called the dorsal root ganglion, right? So ganglion is a group of neuron cell bodies, okay? And so uh, these unipolar neurons, which are sensory, just condense all of their neuron cell bodies in the same place. And so it makes the nerve look a little bit bigger. Okay, finally, the action potential is going to arrive here, right? So this is the axon terminal, right? So calcium would flood into um, these little spaces here, lead to exocytosis of neurotransmitters onto what? Onto this next neuron here, okay? Now, generally, like whenever we're feeling stuff, that information is going to be passed to neurons that are in the white matter. Okay, so the white matter is essentially the highway. It is taking information all the way up to the brain lightning fast, information all the way from the brain lightning fast. But this is a reflex. We do not stop and ask the brain for permission. And so instead of um, synapsing with a neuron that's going to travel um, or is located rather within the white matter going to the brain, instead, these reflexes are immediately um, going to produce a motor response. And so this here, Oops, that is an interneuron. All right, so the interneuron is housed exclusively within the gray matter. Immediately, it is going to depolarize, generate an action potential. That action potential is going to lead to the exocytosis of neurotransmitters here. Okay, and again, these have developed very early on in your life. Um, and so these neurotransmitters are going to synapse with this neuron here. This neuron is a motor neuron, okay. motor neuron, which is also called an efferent neuron. Okay. 
Okay. Um, efferent because the message is E, it's exiting, right? Um, the central nervous system and going out to the rest of the body, to the particular effector tissue. Okay. So the action potential that has been generated by stimulus from the interneuron is going to travel, of course, down this motor neuron. Right. The structure through which it is traveling is called the ventral root. Okay. So ventral meaning it's towards your belly, it's to the front of your body. Okay. It's going to pass through the spinal nerve. Right. And finally, it is going to synapse with your effector tissue. All right. So early on, we decided that this stimulus, right, putting your finger down on a nail or something else painful or hot or whatever, um, should immediately pull your hand away, right? So your biceps brachii is going to be triggered to contract, therefore getting your hand out of harm's way without even asking the brain, right? We know that pain means get out of the situation and then go back and think about it later. Okay. So um, this here would therefore be the effector tissue. Um, it is what is producing the effect. It is actually responding to this particular stimulus here, All right? So literally on the first day of class together, oops, um, actually, give me just a second, guys. Sorry, there was a uh, <laughs> a log that was ready to light. Um, actually, one more moment. I'm gonna pause this so you don't have to watch this later. Um, so literally on the very first day of class, um, we talked about how um, a stimulus is detected in the periphery of the body, okay? And from there, a message is sent to a central control center that is the central nervous system here, or the spinal cord. And then finally, the central nervous system can decide how to respond, okay? And that message is sent to the effector tissue. So here we see something that is immediately um, generated. This stimulus equals that particular response, okay? Um, any questions about that? And again, sorry for that. Uh, <laughs> situation there. <laughs> Good. All right. Thanks, guys. All right. Clearing this and moving on. Um, so bone physiology. Um, we are going to talk about different bone shape categories. We're going to talk about um, the different structures that make up different types of bones. Okay. Um, and then um, essentially in your next lesson, you're going to learn about how bones develop to begin with how we can use them to help the rest of the body, how we can um, fix them when they're damaged. Okay, so lots and lots of different things, um, which is going to build, of course, on what we're talking about now today. Okay. Um, okay, so bone is actually a type of connective tissue. For our last exam, we focused mostly on loose and dense connective tissues, All right? So these are your standard connective tissue proper, what you think about when you think about um, connective tissues, All right? Next semester, we're going to talk about the blood and the lymph, so these fluid connective tissues. And today, we're going to get into more um, detail about both cartilage and bone. They have a lot in common, but then they're also really unique as well. Um, now, to introduce you to this, I have um, a short video. Okay, so just four minutes, and this really does um, neatly sum up all of the different things that we are going to be talking about um, over um, this lesson and the next lesson. So here you go. bones consist of an outer shell of compact bone and an interior of spongy bone. Compact bone is dense and strong and provides an attachment site for muscle. Spongy bone is lightweight, rich in blood vessels, highly porous, 
and contains bone marrow. Blood cells are formed. While bone resembles cartilage, the collagen fibers of bone are hardened by deposits of calcium phosphate. There are three types of bone cells, osteoblasts, bone forming cells, osteocytes, mature bone cells, and osteoclasts, bone dissolving cells. Bone producing osteoblasts form a thin layer covering the outside of the bone. The osteoblasts secrete a hardened matrix of bone and gradually become entrapped within it. They then stop secreting matrix and become osteocytes. Osteocytes are nourished by nearby capillaries and are connected to one another by thin extensions that osteocytes send out to each other through narrow channels in the bone. Although unable to produce more bone, osteocytes secrete substances that control the continuous remodeling of bone. Each year, 5 to 10% of all the bone in your body is dissolved away and replaced. This allows your skeleton to subtly alter its shape in response to the demands placed upon it. For example, by increasing the thickness of bones that carry heavy loads or are subjected to extra stress. Bone remodeling allows bone to be replaced as it ages and becomes brittle. As people age, the remodeling process slows bones tend to become more fragile as a result. The continuous turnover of bone also allows the body to maintain constant levels of calcium in the blood. Calcium from bones is retained in the blood if blood calcium drops, but return to bone if blood calcium levels are adequate or high. This process is regulated by two hormones, calcitonin, which causes the bones to retain calcium, and parathormone, which causes bones to release calcium into the blood. Bone remodeling is the result of the coordinated activity of osteoclasts and osteoblasts. Osteoclasts secrete acids and enzymes that dissolve the hard bone matrix. Working in small groups, osteoclasts tunnel into the bone, creating channels that are invaded by capillaries and osteoblasts. The osteoblasts fill the channel concentric deposits of new bone matrix, leaving only a small opening for the capillary. As a result of this process, in cross-section, hard bone is made up of tightly packed units called Heversian systems, each consisting of concentric layers of bone with embedded osteocytes. The concentric deposits surround a central canal through which a capillary runs. All right. So again, that is a summary of pretty much what we're talking about today, as well as in Wednesday's lesson. Um, so you guys do have the link, the link to that. It is going to be one of those days, like not even kidding. <laughs> next, go to the next one. <sighs> ah. I believe you guys have this link right here and that is to that video. <laughs> Sorry guys, thank you so much for your patience. <laughs> okay, so um, we um, started on Friday learning about all of the different types of, or we started learning about certain types of bones, specifically you guys looked at vertebrae and you looked at ribs and you looked at the sternum. Um, now, um, I want to tell you that all of the 206 bones or approximately 206 bones in our body can be classified according to what shape they have. So at this point, um, you guys have learned about irregular bones, that is vertebrae, okay? Um, these have no predictable shape, They or um, that is their shape is very variable. You can't just say, okay, they are, you know, approximately square in shape or they're super long. Um, they have all sorts of different processes on them. Okay. Um, flat bones, we were already introduced to the sternum. Um, these flat bones um, essentially are exactly that. They are very flat. We see these in our sternum. We see them in our skull. Okay. Um, we also have three other types of bones. Uh, first, we have the sesamoid bones. Um, these really are uh, very rare in the body. Uh, for example, the patella 
or your kneecap mm -hmm. is considered to be a sesamoid bone. Okay, so um, what a sesamoid bone is, is essentially a round flat bone that is found exclusively within a tendon. And so as we're going to see, um, these bones um, have the patellar tendon or patellar ligament on one side and the quadriceps tendon on the other, right? So it's just kind of like floating there with these really long tendons, okay? Um, the short bones are pretty blocky in shape. Right, so they're about as long as they are wide. They don't actually look like little cubes. They have, you know, lots of other depressions and everything in them, but generally um, roughly blocky in shape, as wide as they are tall. Um, and the long bones are really what we spend the most time talking about. The long bones are much longer than they are wide. Um, most of the bones that we discuss are indeed long bones. Um, so your femur, right, your tibia and your fibula, all of these we can of course, think about as long bones, but also each individual phalanx in your finger or in your toes, um, those are all long bones as well, right? You can feel on the back of your hand, right? You can feel tendons and underneath that you can feel bones. These are your metacarpal bones and they are also longer than they are wide. Therefore, they are long bones. So no matter what shape of bone we are talking about, all bones have roughly the same structure, okay? Um, that is, they're made up of the same types of tissue um, and covered with the same types of membranes, et cetera. Okay, so the structural similarities, whether we're talking about a flat bone from the skull, a long bone, this is your thigh bone or your femur, um, all of these bones are collectively covered by the periosteum. As we're going to see here soon, the periosteum is critical in delivering blood flow to the bones. It's critical in bone development, which we'll learn about in our next class. It is critical in healing bone because the periosteum has both fibers, right, as well as stem cells. Right? So the periosteum is very important um, to a lot of different functions of our bone. Um, as you're going to see as throughout this lesson and the next, um, the root ost is really important, right? So the root ost means bone, okay? Um, so bone, um, ost, 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 okay? In this particular uh, structure, peri, right? The perimeter, this uh, structure is going around the perimeter of the bone, okay? So it's covering over the entire bony structure. Okay. Um, if we peel back this periosteum, we see a lot of really strong collagenous fibers that actually fuse the periosteum to the underlying bone. And these fibers are called perforating fibers. Okay. Now, if we look deep to the periosteum, we see an external compact bone structure. Okay. So all the way on the outside, we have a shell essentially of compact bone. All right. So as we can see here, there's hard more solid bone here. This looks like a sponge. It looks pretty gooey. It's not, but it looks that way. So we call it spongy bone. And then finally, another um, layer of this compact bone. Okay. And again, no matter whether we're looking at the flat bones or the long bones, it's all going to have periosteum, compact bone, spongy bone, and then compact and periosteum again. Okay, um, now spongy bone, uh, we can call all sorts of different things, right? It's anatomy, why name something once if we can't name it two or three times? Spongy bone can also be called trabecular bone because of each of these little riblets here. Those are called trabeculae and also cancellous bone. Right? As always, pick which one you like and go with it, but definitely recognize that all three of these terms mean spongy bone. Okay, so let's look at that periosteum in a little bit more detail. Okay. The periosteum uh, covers all of the surfaces of all of our bones with a few exceptions. Um, and those exceptions are generally within the joints, right? So except for joint surfaces, which are actually covered by cartilage, which we're getting there in our next lesson. Um, actually, we're, we're getting there today. Um, the joint surfaces are covered with hyaline cartilage to protect the ends of your bone from abrasion, okay? So the periosteum itself has an outer fibrous layer. Um, and so this, um, if we look closely at this periosteum, we see that there's a fibrous layer all the way on the superficial surface. Um, this is essentially where our muscles attach, right? So if we look up here at this image, um, here is our bone. 
the periosteum would be on the outside. We know that the tendon, right, is dense regular connective tissue, right? It's, it's essentially um, all of those epimysium tissues and all of this external fascia that kind of comes together at the very end of the muscle and it actually fuses with that periosteum, right? So the way that your muscles actually attach to the bone is via these, this outer layer of the periosteum. Okay. And so, um, if you damage a muscle in such a way that you actually like tear the muscle away from the bone, it is your periosteum that is being damaged. Okay. It can heal, right? It can absolutely heal. And the reason that it can heal is because of the osteogenic cells. Okay. So the innermost layer of the periosteum, right? Innermost layer of two layers, um, contain primitive stem cells. Okay. And so stem cells, um, are, cells that can essentially be told what to be when they grow up, right? They're not really grown up just yet. Um, we can turn on different genes and therefore um, produce cells that can grow up to be a bone building cell or it can grow up to be a cartilage cell, right? So these particular osteogenic cells can become any of the different bone cells or any of the different cartilage cells. Okay. And so it's really important to have stem cells on the outside of our bones so that we can heal them, right? So that we can create whatever bone cells we need at the time. And we're getting into that. Um, and, you know, we can replace cartilage. We can do all sorts of different things with these stem cells and their derivatives. Okay. So these osteogenic cells are uh, pretty much right on the surface of the bone. This here is the bone. This is the periosteum. The innermost layer are stem cells that can be told to become bone building cells, bone breaking down cells, adult bone cells, or cartilage cells. Okay. Uh, the periosteum also um, provides a route for about a third of the bone's blood supply. Now we might not think about it very often um, or ever maybe, um, but our bones are super vascular. They are filled with blood. Um, in fact, all of our blood cells are initially made within the bones. Okay, so there's a huge blood supply and about a third of that is delivered via the periosteum. Okay, in our next lesson together, we're going to see how those blood vessels initially enter into the bones and how they can drive the development of the bone. And then of course later, um, or very soon in fact, they can start developing blood cells itself. Okay, um, finally, the periosteum provides a route for uh, the nervous tissue, right? So many nerve fibers are um, able to pass into the bone. Our bones are very sensitive, right? When we're growing up, we can feel our bones growing. It's a little bit sore every time we go through a growth spurt. Well, our nerves are actually growing and stretching out as well. Um, also, um, you know, we can feel aches and pains in our bones. Um, if we break a bone, obviously very, very painful. So there's a lot of blood supply and there are a lot of nerves as well, right? So these, um, these features are tied to the bones, not to the cartilage, right? So um, as we go through, you should be kind of thinking bone versus cartilage. They have a lot in common, but then they're very different as well. Vascular and lots of nervous tissue is a feature of the bones. Okay, now the long bones also have some larger structural features. Okay, so um, whether we're talking about a tiny little phalanx in your finger or we're talking about your entire ulna or your entire radius, um, they all have the same general features. Okay, so what we can see here is actually the femur. Um, on either end of a long bone, there are wide portions, right? So here we can see a skinny shaft and on either end of the long bone, it gets a lot wider. Okay, let's start with the skinny portion in the middle. Um, the skinny portion in the middle is called the diaphysis. It is the shaft of the long bone, and it is going to contain a cavity in the middle. Now, this cavity um, is called the medullary cavity. It's all the way in the middle, um, and it is going to contain yellow bone marrow. Okay, so yellow bone marrow is uh, essentially a fat storage site in adult bones. Okay, um, so if you've ever... Um, if you've ever gotten soup bones from the grocery store or something, or, you know, for your dog or whatever, um, you see the section through, um, 
sorry, through a long bone. And in the middle, there's this like weird gooey stuff, right? So that gooey stuff is actually yellow bone marrow. It is filled with fat. Okay. Um, and this isn't fat that you would like go to the gym and try to get rid of. This is wonderful fat that is um, a reserve for all of the blood making stuff that's happening within your bones. Okay. So very good stuff there. Um, early on in development, um, so like in utero, when you are three months post fertilization or so, this is actually filled with red bone marrow. Um, but that disappears over the course of your life as the other parts of your bones take over this bone making process. We'll get there. Um, okay, so this medullary cavity is of course filled with yellow bone marrow. It is also lined with endosteum, right? So ost means something to do with the bone. Endo means all the way on the inside. And so the endosteum is essentially the equivalent of the periosteum, only endo on the inside of the bone. Okay. Now, the ends of the long bones are called the epiphyses, epiphysis with an I-S for singular or E's, E-S, um, at the end for plural. So this is an epiphysis, this is an epiphysis, together we call them ep epiphyses. Okay. Um, so essentially what these are, are wider regions of the long bones. Um, and the reason that they're wider is so that they can essentially distribute the weight from the joint. Okay, so these widened areas increase the surface area of the joint, and therefore there is less force per square, you know, square inch, square centimeter um, on individual pieces of that cartilage. And so we are distributing the weight, and so there's much less pressure on this lovely hyaline cartilage here. Okay, um, so uh, the word for joint is articulation, and we're going to talk all about those in the next section of the class. Um, articulations um, include the epiphysis itself, right, the epiphysis of both bones. Okay, um, and of course, the long bones are covered with this hyaline cartilage, right? So, hyaline cartilage is the tissue, the structure itself is the articular cartilage. Right, so I know that this is um, a little bit confusing, but the tissue type is hyaline cartilage. The structure itself that is covering the long bone is articular cartilage. Okay, um, so right, think about your epidermis. The structure is the epidermis. The tissue type is stratified squamous epithelial tissue. Right, same kind of a thing here. Even though, um, <laughs> hi Ted. Um, even though. Uh, <laughs> the name is very similar. Both names include the word cartilage. Okay. Um, now the epiphyses are generally um, encapsulating a lot of spongy bone, right? So all of this like darker red stuff here is indeed spongy bone. Um, and so within all of those little uh, interwoven riblets of the spongy bone um, is actually existing red bone marrow. Okay. So literally all of the red blood cells of your adult body are created within your long bones or within this spongy bone here, okay? Um, so uh, all of your red blood cells, all of your platelets, um, the original white blood cells are made there as well, although it gets a little bit complicated with your lymph nodes and everything. That is an AMP2 concept, but um, take home message here is that within the epiphyses, there's a lot of spongy bone and within that spongy bone is the red bone marrow that is where we are making our red blood cells. Okay, uh, any questions about that? All right. Okay, uh, if we look a little bit more closely at these long bones, we can actually see a couple remnants from our early bone development. And so bone development, I'm talking about when you are a baby, you are in mom's uterus and your bones are developing for the first time, we can still see remnants from that process, which you'll learn all about in the next class, in our adult bones. Okay, so uh, first of all, we can see epiphyseal lines, right? These are essentially scars of our growth plates, right? So uh, more technically, these are called epiphyseal plates um, and they are just, um, essentially where your growth was occurring, this conversion from cartilage into bone, um, beginning from, you know, a, a month or two of development in utero, all the way until you stop growing. Um, some of your bones never stop growing until you're like 25, 30 years old. So it is very possible that your bones are still growing right now. Um, 
And so your growth plates aren't closed um, in all of your bones, right? Most of them they are, but um, there are a couple that hold out and they keep on growing for quite some time, right? To be continued in our next lesson together. Um, so uh, these little lines here are essentially compact bone, um, and they are where your bones were growing in length. Okay, the other thing uh, that we can see are, well, these blood vessels, right? The blood vessels pass through the periosteum, and they actually go into the bone, right? So this here is actually a hole in your long bone. It's called a nutrient foramen. Right, so uh, if you watched Friday's lesson, um, you might remember that foramen or foramen, um, this is a word for a hole in a bone. And so this hole in the bone in every single long bone that you have is where your blood vessels are going to enter the bone and therefore um, you know, deliver blood to and take blood away from your bone marrow, right? deliver blood to your, um, your medullary cavity, et cetera. Right, so this is actually where about two thirds of your blood is delivered to your bone. Okay, so this nutrient foramen and the epiphyseal plates, right, these are part of the bone development process and they stay in your bones for the rest of your life. So let's zoom into this bone a little bit more. I've told you about compact bone. I've told you about spongy bone. These are two different types of bone tissue. Right. And so when you guys looked at bone for the last practical exam, you were looking at compact bone. Right. So let's take a look at what all of these different crazy looking structures are. Okay. So the compact bone is the hard outermost portion. Okay. Um, this is the hard weight bearing part of the bone. Okay. So it has to be super strong. It has to have very densely packed um, molecules, fibers, so that it can withstand all of the stresses that we put on it, right? So it is, these bones are constantly bearing our body weight. We do jumping jacks, we go for jogs. So there's a lot, a lot of pressure on our bones. And so the compact bone, its function is really to bear that pressure, to bear that force. Okay, so the compact bone um, essentially has a series of cylinders, right? So you can think about these as a forest of trees, like really closely packed trees. Um, and so there are rings that make up the tree's tissue, right? So ring after ring after ring, all of the trees are closely packed together. And so each one is able to bear a lot of weight and deal with a lot of stress at any given point. Now, these cylinders, right, essentially the trees with all of their concentric rings inside are called osteons. Right? So again, ost means bone. There's a lot of ost stuff in this section. Okay. Um, the individual rings themselves, right, so if we look at the cylinder here, we can see ring after ring. We can pull out each one of those different concentric rings of tissue, and each one of those rings is called a lamella. Okay. So lamella, is singular, lamellae with an A-E is plural, okay? So multiple lamellae make up each one of these osteons. Um, so the structural unit of the compact bone, the structures that give rise to the function, right? This weight-bearing, super strong, resilient to stress function are the osteons, okay? Uh, so each osteon contains four to 20 lamellae. They are arranged in concentric rings, okay? Um, so this particular arrangement is very resistant to stress. It's very strong. Um, and in addition to just the existence of ring after ring after ring, the fibers themselves that make up each one of these lamellar rings, um, are arranged in opposite directions, right? So if we pull out one individual osteon from the compact bone of the humerus here, we can see lamella, lamella, lamella. And we can also see these lines going up to the right or going up to the left. And so this is um, reflective of how these uh, lamellae are structured. Each layer orients the fibers in a different direction. And so instead of just being strong, in this direction, no bear our weight, our bones can actually twist to a small degree because of the opposite orientation of these lamellar um, proteins. 
Okay. Now all the way to the inside of this tree, um, unlike a tree, in fact, um, this is how the cells and the osteon itself are actually able to get blood supply and control by our nervous system. Okay. So all the way on the inside, we have a central canal. Okay, so very similar to our spinal cord. The central canal is where the arteries, veins, and nerves are, um, uh, are located. Also, each central canal is lined with the endosteum. Right? So there are actually stem cells all the way on the inside of each and every uh, osteon within the compact bone. Um, zooming in a little bit more. Right? Again, we can see individual lamellae. Okay. Zooming into the central canal and a few of these lamellae, what we see is the artery in the vein, red and blue, lamella and lamella, okay, and squished in between each of the lamellae are cells, okay, and so this here is a cell and this is a cell. These cells are called osteocytes. Now remember when we initially talked about the, com the connective tissue, I told you that the um, essentially ending of cell names within connective tissue tells you exactly what it does. So the term site, right, the root site, means just normal old mature adult cell. And so a site cell in an osteo bone is a mature bone cell. Okay, so these guys live actually in between the lamellae. Okay. Um, so this is an osteocyte, this is an osteocyte, and so is this here. Um, now, essentially, how do these guys get here? Uh, just as the video earlier this class showed you, these cells used to be something different, right? So these uh, osteocytes were originally osteoblasts. Now, remember, blast, these are the building cells, right? So osteoblasts are going to build cells. We're going to see, uh, or they're going to build bone. We're going to see that at the end of today's lesson. But these guys are so good at what they do at spitting out bony tissue in this direction, in that direction, in that direction, that they actually bury themselves in the bone that they themselves made. Okay, so they trap themselves within this bony tissue and they are stuck there for the remainder of their lives. Now they're still living, right? So they leave themselves a little cavity called a lacuna, right? And so they live within these little cavities for the rest of the life of the bone or this particular part of the bone anyway. Um, of course, once they become trapped in their lacuna, we call them an osteocyte because they're no longer building bone, they're just maintaining the bone. Okay, now a cell, an osteocyte way over here or way over here, it of course is not close to the central canal, right? So it can't directly get nutrients, it can't directly get oxygen from the blood. So the only way that these cells way out here, farther away from the central canal, can actually get the things that they need to survive is via little cytoplasmic extensions through canals that, again, these osteoblasts, now osteocytes, have made for themselves, right? So they don't completely isolate themselves when they bury themselves in bone. They keep their little arms out to the sides so they can communicate, interact with their neighboring osteocytes and actually get nutrients from that. Okay, so what happens here is that nutrients and oxygen are delivered in the arterial blood. They go to this cell, pass through these little canals to this cell, pass through these little canals to this cell, right? So this actually limits uh, the diameter of the osteons because nutrients literally have to get passed from one to the next to the next. These little canals through which the osteocytes stick out their little cytoplasmic arms, these are called canaliculi, right? It literally says canal in the name. So uh, canaliculi connect adjacent lacunae, which is where the osteocytes live. Okay, lots of terms, right? Hopefully this is a little bit familiar from looking at the lab videos last week, um, but you know, still some time to get familiar with these terms. Okay, so let's look at this in a slightly different way. Okay, so nutrients, um, as we know, um, are delivered through the blood, and the blood vessels are actually housed within each of the central canals. Okay, um, 
of course, to get nutrients all the way from the blood vessels and the central canals out to more peripheral osteocytes, these nutrients must pass through the canaliculi from osteocyte to osteocyte to osteocyte. Okay. Um, and so earlier this semester, when you guys were looking at histology, this is what you saw. Okay. Um, here's the central canal. Each one of these little rings here is a lamella. And these little holes are where the osteocytes live. Okay. So a little bit more context or something that you guys have already seen before. Okay. Now, the osteons, of course, are made up of lamellae. Right, these concentric rings. But there are also lamellae or layers of bony tissue that go all the way around the perimeter of the cell, just deep to the periosteum. Okay, and that's actually another um, residual effect of the bone development or bone growth process. We're getting there. Okay, um, so these cylinders are osteons, but all the way around the outside are called circumferential lamellae. So around the circumference of the entire bone. Okay, so just inside the periosteum, they're going to add both strength and thickness, diameter to the bone. Um, and these are deposited via appendicular growth. That is something you're going to learn in Wednesday's lesson. Okay. Um, another structure that I want to point out are the perforating canals. Um, so the perforating canals um, are essentially um, tunnels within the bones that allow blood vessels to actually um, pass through these central canals. Okay, so they are going to be the transverse canals. Central canals are, uh, are vertical. Okay. All right, so let's look at spongy bone now. Remember that structure always matches function. The compact bone is the weight-bearing portion of the bone. Okay. Um, and so it has to have really densely packed fibers. Okay. Spongy bone has a little bit of a different function. Okay. It is in fact really strong, right? Just not necessarily, um, you know, the same as the compact bone. Okay. Um, and so it's usually not weight bearing like the compact bone is, and therefore it doesn't have to be as densely packed. Okay. So again, we're talking about all the way on the inside here. This looks like a sponge. This looks like a sponge here. Okay, so it looks like it's not as strong. In fact, it looks really squishy. Um, even though these little spicules, like these little riblets of bony tissue within the spongy bone look completely disorganized, they look really squishy. In fact, they are very highly organized, right? And, and in fact, they're also really strong as well. Um, and so uh, I want to point out that uh, you know, if you go into the main academic spine at Stockton and you look up, you see all of these trusses, right? So this um, iron structure here with, uh, you know, little angle iron pieces in all of these different directions, right? This is a very strong configuration, right? Even though these trusses are not solid iron, they are still incredibly strong. They're essentially distributing the weight from the roof, in this case, down to other portions of um, these connected bits of iron. And so this structure is incredibly strong, but at the same time, it's much lighter than a solid piece of iron, okay? So our spongy bone is essentially acting like these trusses, right? They are designed in such a way and organized in such a way that they distribute the weight, but at the same time, they're not super condensed, right? So they're not really heavy, right? This saves us some body weight, hooray for us, right? Um, and also it allows a lot of extra space for that red bone marrow to actually reside, right? So the red bone marrow can be protected and still the spongy bone is really strong because of this particular orientation, okay? Um, furthermore, the spongy bone does actually align along, um, the direction of stress, right? So for example, um, this up here is the femur, here's your hip, here's your knee. And so the body weight is going to um, exert this force right here on the head of the femur. And the uh, trabeculae, these little riblets of bone, um, align in such a way that they are super strong in this direction, right? The direction that they're always 
experiencing the most stress. Okay. Um, also, um, the wider spongy bone filled epiphyses can distribute this weight. And again, the trabeculae or these little riblets of bone are aligned to distribute the weight out. So there's not one little piece of your knee that's always getting worn down and the rest of it's not getting worn down at all. Right? It's distributed relatively evenly, um, ideally anyway. Okay. Um, so the spongy bone looks really spongy, looks really weak. It's not as strong as the compact bone, but it's still really strong. Okay, so let's add some terms here. Um, these little riblets of bone that actually make up the sponginess of the bone um, are called trabeculae. Right? Again, this is a feminine plural ending. So trabecula is singular, add an E instead of an S to make this uh, structure plural. Um, if we take a section through the trabeculae, we see that there are indeed concentric lamellae. Right, these concentric layers of bony tissue with the osteocytes and their little canaliculi inside. Okay, it is surrounded by um, stem cells and ost um, and bone building cells from the endosteum. Okay, so this is also a living tissue. We can build it up. We can break it down. If all of a sudden you decide um, to you know, start dancing in such a way, and so now the stresses on your bones are in a different direction than they are when you're just like walking, um, your spongy bone, and actually all of your bones are going to remodel themselves to be prepared and to be strong in those different directions now, right? So just like the video showed you at the beginning of this lesson, we're always building up and breaking down our bony tissue. Okay, so if you decide to start doing something brand new today, your bones might take a couple of years, but they will catch up and they will be prepared um, uh, or they will be able to withstand all of those extra stresses. Okay, um, so there are no osteons in the spongy bone, right? The structural unit of the spongy bone are the trabeculae. Osteons are part of the compact bone only. Note that this is not an osteon. There is no central canal, right? There are lamellae, but there's no central canal. Instead, these structures, you know, this part of the bone actually gets its nutrients, its oxygen from the bone marrow, right? So remember that the bone marrow and vessels are woven in this spongy bone, right? So all of these little spaces here are filled with bone marrow, right? So making red blood cells constantly, okay? So no central canals, but the spongy bone is chock full of blood. Blood is not in short supply, okay? Um, so uh, on that note, I wanted to very briefly mention um, how bone marrow is extracted, right? So you might need a uh, bone marrow sample. If, um, for example, leukemia is suspected, um, you might uh, be such a wonderful human that you are donating some of your bone marrow to somebody who has an illness. Um, you know, for whatever reason, in order to extract bone marrow, um, generally bone marrow is taken from the hips. And so keep in mind that there is bone marrow, you know, within the flat bones, right? So spongy bone here, um, spongy bone within the epiphyses of all of your long bones, right? But generally um, bone marrow is taken from the hips uh, because this is one of the most active sites for bone or for blood cell development into your adulthood. Right, so your long bones kind of taper off a little bit um, as you get older, leaving mostly, you know, your flat bones and your irregular bones like these. Um, of course, if you were to try to take bone marrow from a flat bone, right, lots of very uh, delicate structures, <laughs> very uh, closely uh, beneath um, the flat bones. Um, your sternum, the same thing, right? Your sternum is very active in making bone bone blood cells throughout your life. But of course, if the doctor, you know, messes up, if there's an accident, your heart and your lungs are like right next to your sternum. And so um, generally there's a lot of muscle surrounding your hips and your hips, your hip bones are very active in making blood for your entire life. And so this is the safest place that you can drill into the bone to extract bone marrow um, compared to all of the other places. Um, okay, so brief aside, that's not a lecture exam kind of a uh, concept, but just so you know. 
Um, so to summarize here, flat bones, long bones, all of your bones have an outer layer of compact bone, inner layer of spongy bone. The spongy bone is made up of trabeculae. The compact bone is made up of osteons, right? They're all containing the same types of cells, the same type of tissue. It's just organized in a slightly different way. Okay, so um, we're going to end today with just a couple questions. Okay, um, this is a, um, a humerus actually, so generic long bone. Um, the end of the long bone is called what? And what structure covers it? All right, so let's see where you guys are. Is it a medullary cavity covered by the periosteum? Epiphysis covered by the periosteum? Epiphysis covered by the articular cartilage? Or epiphysis covered by the hyaline cartilage? All right, remember the structure is the name of this particular thing. The tissue type is what substance is it made out of? All right, so um, very close there. Thank you guys for, for taking a stab at this one. All right, so you can see the bracket. We're talking about this little blue portion on the fat end of a long bone. All right, in the interest of time, um, great job. The majority is indeed correct. Okay, so the end of the long bone is called the epiphysis, epi, meaning on top of. It's on top of the long bone, proximal and distal side. Very good. Um, and this is the articular cartilage. Okay, so the structure is articular cartilage. It's cartilage over the articular surface, over the joint surface. Okay, it is made of hyaline cartilage, which is one of the types of tissue that we looked at before our practical exam. Okay, so the answer here would be C. Okay, let's do another. Uh, all right, uh, which is true about this structure? All right, so this here with the arrow, um, is this the endosteum and made of elastic cartilage? Is it the dermis of the bone and made of dense irregular connective tissue? Like we know the dermis to be. Is it the periosteum and made of dense irregular connective tissue? Or is it the periosteum and made of dense irregular connective tissue and osteogenic stem cells? Very good. It seems like you guys are narrowing down um, endosteum dermis versus periosteum. Very good. Right. Remember, peri is around the perimeter. So here we can see that this is on the superficial surface of the bone. So what is the periosteum made of? Just connective tissue or connective tissue and stem cells? All right. And very good. Um, Yes, D is correct. All right, so stem cells as well as dense irregular connective tissue. The connective tissue is there for the attachment of muscles. The stem cells are there to maintain the bone. Good. All right, and finally, um, just one more. What's that? The structure, this little line here is called a trabecula, an epiphyseal line a perforating canal or an osteon. I remember we're zoomed out here. We're looking at the whole bone. We can see spongy bone here, spongy bone here, a tiny little line of essentially compact bone that's only in the epiphysis, only in the end of the long bone. All right, uh, so the majority is correct. Fantastic job. Um, trabecula, those are the little riblets of the spongy bone. So the structural unit of the spongy bone. The epiphyseal line, which is indeed the correct answer here. Mm -hmm. um, this is a essentially a scar of your growth plates, of your epiphyseal plates. Uh, perforating canals are the little holes within your bone that allow blood to travel from out here 
into the bone and deliver blood to each one of the osteons. And of course, osteon is a microscopic structure. It is the structural unit of the compact bone, so this harder shell around the entire outside of the bone. 